All right. Uh, how's it going, everybody? Welcome to this week's episode of Life Imitating Movies. It's a podcast for me and my buddy Mitch over there. Uh, we pull news stories from the week, and then we kind of pick movies that similar themes to those stories. Um, so this week's question to kind of launch us into the episode, I, I was thinking about... Um, so I, I do a lot of writing. Uh, I, I've written scripts and everything, and dialogue is, is extremely important to me. And so I was started thinking about I, I've had I've had a movie that has this line of dialogue in it that I've been obsessed with since I first heard of it. And so I guess kind of launch it in was the question was what what's your favorite movie quote or a line of dialogue from a movie that you love or that you were like you heard it and you're like wow that's awesome yeah so when i was coming up with this answer obviously you want to go with one of your favorite movies but then for the question like your, your favorite line of dialogue from a movie ever might not necessarily be in your favorite movie so um you know i'll just say my answer and then kind of explain it um i picked the famous line no I am your father from Empire Strikes Back, Star Wars, Darth Vader when he's talking mm -hmm. to Luke Skywalker, because I mean, I dare you to find, you know, a more iconic line that people just seem to know and are born with the knowledge of that they know exists and they know the, the plot point from a movie because it seems like people are just born knowing this. So unfortunately, it's hard to really take anybody by surprise that hasn't seen it. You know, it's just common knowledge at this point, but the way it's delivered and the, the swell in the music in the actual scene when it's said and, you know, the impact that it has on the story and just the way it's just become a mainstay in pop culture. Like, again, people just know about this plot point and know the line. It just to me, that's like my favorite and it's the best line of dialogue of all time. That is, I mean, yeah, I guess to the pantheon of famous quotes, that is probably, it might even be the most famous, you know, that is, uh, I think that's, it's the original, like, surprise ending, surprise, if you will, um, because I don't think anybody, I don't think even, if you've heard Mark Hamill tell the story, I think he says that, you know, he didn't even know that that was part of it until they were shooting it or something like that. Um, that's a good choice, man. Yeah. I, I, I'm a, I'm not a huge star Wars. I, I enjoy the movies. They're not like, I'm not like a diehard. Oh my God. Star Wars is the greatest thing on earth, but they're good, man. You know, when I look this up um, and you, if you, if you wanted to see kind of people's reaction to this, for watching it for the first time, a lot of the videos will be like parents posting videos of their kids reacting to this. Because again, that's how young you have to get them to watch this movie before it becomes known, you know, because like everybody just knows this. So, and it's funny because kids probably have the same reaction. I'm sure there are adults out there that haven't seen the movie that would have the same type of reaction, but the reaction is, you know, kind of, it takes a second to sink in and then it's kind of shock. Like, no, is he, is he really his father? Like he's lying, right? Like, no, no way. Like what? So it's just, it's a great, you know, kind of classic movie line. So the reason I picked this was there's a movie I love that it's a, it's a, it's a top 20 movie for me. Uh, it's a movie called lucky, lucky number 11. You ever seen it? No, but I know of it. It's such a good movie, man. It's got Josh Hart, Ed Bruce Willis, uh, Lucy Liu, Morgan Freeman, Ben Kingsley. And Ben Kingsley is actually the one who says my favorite quote. It's a, it's a little bit longer than your quote. Um, but the quote is, the unlucky are nothing more than a frame of reference for the lucky, Mr. Fisher. You are unlucky so that I may know that I am not. Unfortunately, the lucky never realize they are lucky until it's too late. Take yourself, for instance. Yesterday, you were better off than you are off today, but it took today for you to realize it. But today has arrived, and it's too late. Okay. I just, that's my all, it's, it's, it's just my all-time favorite live. The first time I heard it, dude, 
I was like, that's such a great line of dialogue, man, because it's just, it's just, you, you know, you have to have a frame of reference of, of unlucky to know that you are lucky. And it's just such a gnarly and just Ben Kingsley, the way he says it, uh, it's just, it's just been, I've been obsessed with that line forever, man. Since I don't know, 2007, I think the movie was released. And it's, you know, it's not like a simple quote, like, you know, I know I'm your father or of all the gin joints in all the world, but it's, it's just when you, when you think about like dialogue that makes you just kind of go sit back and think and go, whew, I like that. That, that was one of the, that was one of the first that I can remember just kicking back and going, wow, that was, that was a well, well written piece of dialogue. The first story up, on our journey here is a story that came out this week that Krispy Kreme was doing a limited edition, literally one day only donut for uh, the Mars Rover that was landing yesterday. Well, I guess it'd be three or four days ago when this launches, but we record this on Friday. So yesterday it landed on Mars and the purpose of it was to go explore a crater that they believe once had a lake that potentially had life on Mars. So that's the type of stuff. I find that stuff endlessly fascinating. And I could have went with the story just about that, but I was like, no, let's go with the donut story because who doesn't like a nice donut? <laughs> yeah. So what I, read, about you? Are you- I read the description for the donut and it does sound really good. And unfortunately the one day that it was available was yesterday, Thursday, and we're in the middle, at least in this region, I'm sure a lot of the country of this snow and ice storm combo. So not really whether to go venture out and get it, but it still sounded good. And I'm glad that they were doing something to celebrate something scientific like this, the rover landing on Mars. I was, yeah, it was, it was an interesting story because it wasn't a pop culture tie in donut or anything, something, you know, it wasn't like a Snooky donut or a real housewives donut. It was, it was something interesting. It was something like, Hey, you know, you know, let's put this thing out there. Maybe kids will look into what this is about or whatever, if they don't readily know. And, and if you saw the donut, the donut was cool looking. It was like a red donut with like, cookie crumbs on it to make it look like the dust of our it was a really cool looking donut um yeah the uh so the donut was cool but i mean like just you know touching on the the mars landing for a second you know it was pretty incredible getting to look at some of those images that came out on thursday of the rover and it landing on the planet and you're you're literally looking at the surface of another planet in our solar system i think you know you have to be pretty uh, something not to be a, a little excited or blown away by that, that we're able to get these pictures of the surface of Mars in pretty good clarity, pretty quick after they were sent from, again, another planet. So it just, it was a really cool thing to kind of read about and look at the, uh, the footage and the pictures that were coming out from that. So it, it's a great scientific thing that it seems like is getting some attention. Yeah, dude. I mean, that is true. The images that they came back were pretty quick images. And when you realize it's like two mil, over 2 million miles away to Mars. And what they say, they have a helicopter, like a drone helicopter that they're going to fly over the crater or whatever to look through stuff. And I was just like, that's freaking awesome, man. So I, I'm interested. I think a lot of people, when they think, oh, we're going to find life on Mars, I think a lot of people think like, oh, we're going to find, you know, aliens, and then, you know, green people. And it's like, no, they're going to find bacteria. That's what we're looking for, things that aren't perceptible to the naked eye. With that, I'll launch into my movie pick, which is, uh, you know, we're talking about life on Mars. And I think when you think of life on Mars, the only movie there is, Total Recall. Mm. No, not the same? No, it, um, you know, we'll get to mine in a little bit, but I felt like this and mine were like the only two kind of clear cut choices, like, you know, well-known popular movies to really talk about with this story. So, you know, we'll get to mine in a little bit, but I was thinking Total Recall, but, you know, let's hear about your uh, perspective on it first. I just, I love the you know, Total Recall. It's like, it's like one of the first R-rated movies I saw when I was a kid. It's like that classic Schwarzenegger, early 90s, late 80s, early 90s R-rated movie. Uh, it's got the, the chick with three boobs, which is like the best part if you saw the movie when you were young. <laughs> um, 
And uh, the only thing I'm not a big fan of, and this is a movie that came out in 1990, so uh, it's, uh, what, 30 years old? So I don't like the ambiguous ending. I'm not a huge fan of ambiguous, ambiguous endings. When you get to the end of the movie, it isn't clear if the movie takes place on Mars or if it was all in his head from this recall center on Earth. And so those are things where I'm like, it doesn't ruin the movie before because I think I think it's a classic. You know, you got Sharon Stone in it being awesome, and but it's it's a it's a cool movie, man. It's a cool Mars Life on Mars movie. You ever seen it? Yeah, I have. Um, I think the ending. You know, the thing with ambiguous ones, and it's kind of like Joker, which we talked about either last week or the week before, where it almost kind of lets you pick which ending you think happened and just kind of go with that and you just say i'm going to assume this ending you know this way is the right way the way it happened because it lets you if it's left ambiguous if it's if it's left open then you're kind of led to you know believe whatever you want to believe so it's like joker where it's like again did it happen or was it all in his head well you know i'm just going to think that it happens you know i like that ending better so you know, I like the ending better in this one where it's like, you know, it's not just all in his head. You know, we saw everything happen and it happened the way it happened. And that's how the story ends. And I like that ending better than, oh, just the usual it was all in their head kind of explain it away ending. So, no, Total Recall is a good it's just, you know, a good by the numbers action movie. You know, it's got some classic one liners um you know consider that a divorce like you know just it's got some good action and it it has obviously an interesting setting taking place on mars and there's some good sci-fi elements to it as well and arnold is you know at his best and he you know just kicking butt and he's just like it's it's a good action movie with like a sci-fi backdrop can i hear your arnold impression one more time (laughs) no no it, it only it only happens once per episode okay (laughs) <laughs> nah, just a great movie, man. But now you got me curious. What, what, what's the other Mars movie that you had on your brain? Then? So I feel like the other clear cut choice for this one was a little movie directed by your boy Ridley Scott called The Martian, with Matt starring Matt Damon. And yeah. you know, mm-hmm. I feel like that was the the clear cut choice for this because you know, obviously, it takes place on Mars. He's living on Mars. He has to escape Mars. It's all about Mars, but. Um, I saw this movie for the first time a couple of years ago. You know, I didn't see it when it came out immediately or right after that. But about a year or two ago, I saw it for the first time. And it was really good. It's It's got a, a huge cast. Like, you know, that would be one of the few bad things I would say about it is that with its great cast, not enough people get the screen time that they need. You know, because you got Donald Glover, who doesn't even like come into the movie until like an hour or two in. And you got people that like, you know, steal their scenes that they're in. And again, you got people that it's like, I wish I would have seen more of these actors in this movie, but it's just a great story in the vein of, you know, Castaway or something like that, where it's a survival movie where this person's trying to escape their surroundings. And Matt Damon, his character is stranded on Mars after being accidentally left behind by his crew on a mission there. And He's got to escape the planet, but, you know, easier said than done. But it's just a really good uh, movie, even though it has like a little bit of length to it. It doesn't really feel like it drags that much, you know, like it stalls or the plot kind of slows down at some points. It just it feels like a quick watch and it's a good one. The Martian is a top 10 movie of all time for me. I absolutely love it. Um, And it's yeah, it does. I think it's a two hour 20 minute movie and it's perfectly paced but it's funny you mentioned the casting because literally last night i was watching jimmy kimmel and jodie foster was on jimmy kimmel and and jodie foster did one of the you know those master class things that like they have like hugely famous people teach so she did one about directing and apparently in that she said she wanted to give a um an example of she said that the good directors should come out of a movie that they didn't maybe enjoy or maybe they enjoy, but they think about how they could do it better. And so the example she gave was the Martian. And she said that the way she would have done it was the movie is supposed to be about Matt Damon's isolation. So she would have focused the entirety of the movie on Matt Damon on Mars and cut out everything else. 
So I think that goes into your all the actors and 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 that and uh, not enough screen time. Personally, I I, I enjoyed that because I enjoy seeing like you know Jessica Chastain is a supporting character doing a phenomenal job. Jeff Daniels, one of my favorite actors, is amazing in that movie. Kristen Wiig, Donald Glover, like you said, uh, Sebastian Stan. That dude is one of those actors that just pops up and like a ton of movies and supporting roles. And you're just like, that guy's awesome. Obviously he's winter soldier, but for nobody who doesn't know who he is. Um, yeah, dude, Martian is just, it's just one of those movies, man. I could watch it once a week. I love it. I think that's what happens when you give these smaller parts to big name actors is that they only have a little bit of time to work with, but because of that, they do such a great job because they're not on screen forever. They are just given this small part. And because again, they're a good caliber actor or actress, they just dominate the scene that they're in. I think that's what kind of makes this movie better is because again, it's got such a wide ranging cast, but it just, not everybody gets, you know, hours of screen time. So it's like the small scenes that each of them are in, they do their job and then some, and it's just, you know, we don't have time to go through all the names and there are more than you listed, but you know, I like uh, a lot of actors in this one too and actresses. So moving on here, um, another big event uh, coming up this week that just passed was Mardi Gras in new Orleans. And obviously if you live in that area, it's a big event every year. And unfortunately, because of everything going on, because of the coronavirus, it's unable to be held the way it usually is. But, you know, I, f I found this to be a really good story because people are doing it their own way instead, and they're really making the best of the situation. So instead, what they're doing is making house floats. So basically, people are decorating their houses like it's Halloween on the popular streets in New Orleans and Mardi Gras usually held. And, you know, they're just decking out their homes with uh, they pick their themes and just deck out their homes. And it's like, they call them house floats and, you know, people are still going to go around and they're going to have stuff maybe out on their porch or their gate or their fence or whatever for people to have just a little party favors and things like that. And I thought, you know, that's a, was a really good way to substitute celebrating as usual instead of just ignoring, you know, safety and say, let's do it anyway. And let's celebrate Mardi Gras that this was, a really good alternative that people came up with and it's good to see that they're still in good spirits and you know that, that they still get to celebrate this occasion yeah so we do we went to new orleans for the uh for his bachelor party and you know did the whole french quarter thing did uh we did a ghost tour which was pretty it wasn't that good or anything but um the article i like was that the the house floats movement began on november 17th of last year and for those familiar with uh, the best day of the year being November 17th, because that's when I was born. But uh, no, to get this, sorry, I, it's a good idea, man. It, it lets you, I like that, you know, people aren't letting this, 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 they, they found a way to, 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 to still have their, their, um, their Mardi Gras in, in essence. And that's, that's what I like. It, it takes creativity in a time like this, they keep some of these things going because they can't be forgotten. I don't think Mardi Gras is ever going to be forgotten, but I, I appreciate what this person did. And I appreciate that the neighborhood came together to be like, right on, let's do it. And I bet you this was more family friendly. I don't know how family friendly Mardi Gras is, you know, from what we know about it, beads and stuff, not family friendly. So this seems more like it was like a family friendly Mardi Gras. Yeah, I think um, picking a, a movie to kind of go along with the story, there's a lot of places that you could go with it to pick something. But with mine, it's just, you know, it's a story set in New Orleans. It really celebrates the culture of this city and the state. So I actually went with The Princess and the Frog from Disney. And I like this one. I actually just saw this for the first time during the pandemic months back, you know, sometime in 2020. And I really like this one because it's one of the last 2D animated films they did kind of in that style. And it's a style that I greatly prefer over all their films today that have just that same Pixar 3D animation look. And don't get me wrong, their movies look good, but they're on the same style now, which is why when you get a movie like the Lego movie or Into the Spider-Verse that has a different style and a different animation to it that 
you really people really seem to like it and it just looks so much different and unique than every other animated movie we see these days because Disney makes so many of them so many of our animated movies these days come from Disney and they all have that Pixar 3D animated look to them so it really falls on the story for those to really differentiate themselves from each other to really stand out um, but Princess and the Frog it's um it's a good story uh, again like I said it celebrates the the culture of the area and has a different kind of cast to it than you see in other Disney movies you know voiced by different people from different walks of life and different ethnicities and you know characters and it just I think it's a it's a really nice change of pace again from not only the 3D animation but from the stories and the characters from previous movies so unfortunately it didn't do as well at the box office as they hoped at the time. So a sequel or them making movies similar to that visual style kind of got killed with the box office intake. But I think it's still a good standalone Disney movie and a good animated movie overall. All right, um, I have never seen Princess and the Frog. I don't know much about it. I think I, the only thing I do know about it, I think, is like, wasn't that like the first black Disney princess or something to that effect? Yeah. So, uh, but you're right. I mean, to go to delve into the 2D, 3D thing, I personally, I love the Pixar animation. I do, I get what you're saying in terms of it. The 3D animation hasn't taken a much, a giant step forward in terms of things, but I think little little things that maybe aren't perceptive to the audience so much which is if you ever watch water from early 3d movies to now they couldn't do water like i remember reading an article about how they said doing water drops or flowing water was like the hardest thing to do in 3d animation and now they do vast ocean shots i mean finding nemo finding dory and stuff so it's just, I think, 3D animation, you, you maybe not be getting the huge technological advances, but like those little things where water, just flowing water, has become so much more, more realistic in the last 25 years since Toy Story was the first ever, you know, fully 3D animated movie. And uh, I, I mean, I, you know, I, I appreciate I, I would I wouldn't mind seeing a nice throwback 2D animated film again. You know, I, I would, you know, a nice it would be nice to see another one, a, a, a new t t traditional throwback Disney style 2D animated movie again. The movie I picked for this one was uh, I just went with the, the theme of a neighborhood that comes together for a common goal. And with that, I went with another one of my all-time favorite movies, The Burbs. You ever seen that? No. You never saw? Oh, dude, check out The Burbs, man. Do you know what it is at least or no? No idea. All right, man. Well, Tom Hanks. It's a Tom Hanks movie uh, from, I think it was 1990, 1989. And it's basically about uh, Tom Hanks, they're in this neighborhood and Tom Hanks, <clears throat> his neighbors move in and they're very weird. And so the neighborhood thinks that um, something is up with these neighbors. They think that they killed the previous tenants. It's a PG rated movie. It's got Corey Feldman in it, Bruce Dern, Tom Hanks, Carrie Fisher's in it. Um, it's just such a good movie, man. You should, and this, the score for it's like one of the best scores I ever made. Um, I don't, I don't even know how else to explain it other than this is one you need to put on your your bucket, your 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 table, your list of your stack. That's the word I was going for. Your stack of movies to watch because it's it's a classic, dude. It's so good. I'll take it into consideration. Just given how I've never even heard of it, I mean, it seems like maybe you might have a more nostalgic view of it. Maybe you know because like I've never heard of it and. It's not really a movie that you see pop up on a lot of platforms, but you know, if you like it, then that's all that matters. But you know, what what genre would you say this kind of falls under, given the premise? Oh, it's a comedy. Okay, it's a comedy. It's a um, it's a, it's like an eighties eighties Tom Hanks movie where he was doing like these like kind of slapstick comedies. It's directed by Joe Dante. Do you know who Joe Dante is? He did uh, 
Gremlins. Uh, yeah, did a lot of those like early creature features. It's just like a really offbeat movie about they suspect his na- their neighbor killed these people and they're just weird and so they're trying to spy on them and their other neighbor goes missing so they're all like what's going on in this little cul-de-sac neighborhood it's it's check it out and it it is a nostalgic movie because it is from my childhood but i watch it every year because every summer the second saturday of july is what's called burbs day so it's one of those movies i'll watch once a year just i you yeah Throw it on your throw it on your list, man. It's such a good movie. You must have a, a calendar of when to watch certain movies because you always talk about watching certain ones on holidays and certain days of the year. You must have like a calendar that you keep somewhere that has watch movie on this day, watch this on this day. Pretty much, man. I, I'm I'm a tool. I don't know if you've known that, noticed that from knowing me these last couple of years, but I'm a massive tool, and I those days that are meaningless to most people are ones where I'm like, I'm going to watch it. I don't need an excuse to watch a movie, but if I have one, all the better. All right. So the next story on our journey here is um, there's a change.org petition going around that somebody started to uh, make sure that Johnny Depp comes back as Captain Jack Sparrow. Uh, Not sure if you keep up with the news at all, but you know, he's had some legal trouble. He's, past few years and disney kind of wanted to distance himself from that and uh <clears throat> get rid of johnny depp and the pirates franchise i have signed this petition even though i don't believe in petitions because there's really no point like this this particular petition has a five hundred thousand goal and right now they are as of this moment they are five thousand two hundred and eleven signatures away from that goal though this is why i don't understand what a petition does once they reach 500,000, what happens? Is it just, oh, cool, we hit our goal, like nothing happens? But the story at hand is, I love Johnny Depp. I love Captain Jack Sparrow. I love the character. So I do want Johnny Depp back in these movies. I can understand maybe if he's not the lead character, if they want to kind of toss it off to another good actor to kind of maybe show a different world in this pirate's world or whatever. But we need Johnny Depp in these movies. I guess I'm going to take the opposite side because I say, well, I'm with you where I don't really see what kind of difference this might make. But, uh, but you know, let people support what they want to support with this. But, you know, I'm, I'm on the other side of the aisle where I, I think we've had enough of Johnny Depp as, as Captain Jack Sparrow. We've had four, five, six movies of him as that character. We've gotten plenty of screen time as that at him as Jack Sparrow. And I think the franchise itself, again, like you kind of said, it just needs some new blood. You know, it's the movies in quality have kind of been hit or miss the last few of them. And, you know, the they're doing like a, a reboot of sorts, I think, with Margot Robbie kind of headlining, which I think could be a good thing to, again, mix it up and go in a new direction with this franchise. But this is one of those franchises I think has kind of overstayed its welcome. You know, we've had a lot of these movies and again, some of them have not been that good. So I'd be fine if they just went in a totally different direction. Right. I mean, I'll give you my movie. I just went with the first Pirates of the Caribbean. That's my movie, but it's more than much just to continue what we're already discussing, which is I, the first one is by far the best. The second and the third one got a little... Oh, okay. There's a different view there, so but we'll get to that. But I think the first one is the best. But then the second and third one, I feel like got a little confusing, but I still enjoyed them for the most part. And that's what I, kind of what I'm saying with like infusing the new blood. Margot Robbie coming on board to be the new lead of the, fan, of the franchise is awesome. I love Margot Robbie, so she's going to do a great job. Obviously, I just want Johnny Depp in there so that we have some sort of connective tissue of them. Like I just want to see that character in the new one to some capacity, not just a cameo, maybe a supporting role with Margot Robbie, 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 whatever, taking the lead. So first let's get to your opinion of the, of the first one. Did you not enjoy it or what? No, I did like the first one. I remember I saw this when it first came out and, you know, it was different than other stuff that was being shown at the time in terms of movies, you know, this like pirate movie and, you know, 
people may not know, it's based off of the Disney Park ride. They had a ride before these movies came out and it was like a pirates, you know, it was like a lazy river kind of cruise. And there were, it was in like a pirate setting, you know, these animatronic pirates and stuff going on around it. And that's what they kind of base this, these movies on. And, you know, I think the first one did a really good job of kind of translating that, that amusement park ride somehow into a movie and then, you know, establishing the world that the other movies kind of branched off of. So, I think the good one or the the first one is a good solid kind of action adventure movie, you know, and it's like a, a good, you know, kind of representation of that time period and, you know, how people acted and dressed and it's like a look back in history, not, you know, word for word history, but, you know, still an entertaining kind of pirate movie and a good adventure kind of thing. So, I, I, I wouldn't say the first one's the best one, but I'll get to mine in a second. But, you know, what did you kind of think about the movie, too? The first movie or what? The first one. Oh, I mean, I absolutely love the first one, man. The, <clears throat> the score for the first one's one, again, one of the best scores ever made. I, I, I absolutely love it. Uh, even in, in college, we did a... Uh, we shot one of my short films we shot for one of my classes was like this horror movie that this kid wrote, which was a blatant ripoff of the exorcist. And um, what me and my editing partner did was we took a, <clears throat> we turned it into a silent film with black and white with like the bars and everything. And um, we ended it with the pirates of the Caribbean theme. So like the ending is like this, like, you know, the exorcist thing, the demon comes out and everything. It's supposed to be all serious. And then we cut the black. And as soon as we cut the black, we go. It was freaking hilarious. But that's that's neither here nor there. Just that just reminded me of that. But I, I think the Pirates franchise is one of those where it, what's it? The, the law of diminishing returns. The first one for me is a benchmark. I, I think it's phenomenal. And then with each subsequent one, it got worse and worse and worse to where the last one, which was uh, Dead Men Tell No Tales, I still enjoy, but it, uh, it's a far cry from the first one. So, you know, I went in a slightly different direction and I actually picked the sequel to talk about Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Man's Chest. And for me, this is, in my opinion, where the height of the franchise was because it did what a sequel should do it expanded on the things from the first one and took it in a new direction and introduced some new stuff, but it still had some good stakes to it. And it, you know, was still a good adventure movie, which is what you want out of this franchise, you know, a movie about pirates. And, you know, for me after that was when they started to decline. I'm with you where you said a little bit earlier where they got really confusing and just kind of random after that. And I'm with you 100% on that. The third one, which you lose track of the titles for these things, but I think it's called On Stranger Tides. But the third Pirates of the Caribbean movie just, in my opinion, just went off the rails. It just, the you know. One, the third one's called At World's End. Whatever. <laughs> it just, it kind of goes off the rails, the third one. And it just, it, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. And just all these different things are happening. And it just, it seems really messy. And it's a really long movie too, but it doesn't need to be. And, you know, it's like a Michael Bay Transformers movie. And, you know, the second one I think is really good in terms of doing what a sequel should and expand it on the world and introduce some new and interesting concepts. And I think that's where, you know, the height of the quality was. And then after that, it just started to dive. No pun intended. Ah, well played. Um, yeah, I enjoy the second one. Not as much as the first one. That's all I got to say about that. Look, I mean, and you have to appreciate from a visual effects standpoint what they did with the, uh, you know, the crew of the of Davy Jones's ship in the second one, too, because this movie was made in, if it's not the 2000s, the early 2010s. I can't remember the exact year, but for the time, some really good effects digitally that still hold up today when looking at the crew of that ship of the um, the Flying Dutchman. And, you know, you have these sailors that are kind of merged with elements of the ocean and sea creatures. And it's some really cool looking effects and a really, you know, 
different look than we got with the, you know, kind of zombie, ghost, whatever, undead pirates from the first one. But it's still really impressive visually today going back and looking at that. So in keeping with the mostly lighthearted theme of stories for this week, our next one is about how Kit Kat is kind of churning out this new vegan version of its classic candy bar that's made actually from a good bit of, uh, of rice. And, you know, I think this is good that they're providing options to people like this who, you know, it may be a smaller crowd than, you know, the just overall crowd that would normally enjoy a Kit Kat. But, you know, I think it's good that companies are kind of expanding into these other territories and create, creating more variations of their product to reach out to more people. You know, it's a win-win for everybody. And, you know, it's just a nice little inclusion story where they're like, you know what, let's start making things a little bit differently and kind of try some different stuff to see how people respond to it. Uh, so when I lived in L.A., uh, my buddy took me to like this vegan restaurant and I did. I got the vegan nachos out there. And I'm not going to lie. They're pretty delightful, man. So I'm not opposed to a nice vegan meal. But, uh, you know, I uh, I. Yeah, I guess I, I talked myself into it. If if somebody handed me, a, I'm not going to turn it down if somebody hands me a vegan Kit Kat. But you know, I'm not 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 going to go out of my way to to try it either. Maybe curiosity might get the best of me, and I'll be like, oh, let's try what a vegan rice rice based Kit Kat tastes like to see if it actually compares to the two. But we shall see. Yeah, I think, uh, again, there are only so many ways you could go with picking a movie related to the story, you know, and I picked a, a movie related to, to candy and, of, and, and chocolate. So what I picked was the original, the Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory from the 70s. And, you know, I think this is a, a classic kind of childhood film for a lot of people, you know, really hits home. And even if maybe you were already an adult when it came out, it's still kind of inspire some childlike feelings in you and it's just you know gene wilder as willy wonka you know just really great acting performance and it's just a really classic kind of movie you know and it's it's not i don't really see it in a lot of places these days with all the different streaming platforms i don't really see it pop up that much you know because maybe the rights to it are a little complicated but you know i would certainly go back and watch this if i came across it somewhere because again it just it kind of just brings you back to childhood and just, you know, the adventures that happen and just, you know, it just kind of has that, that childlike wonder to it. And, you know, I think, um, cause I've, I haven't read the book, but I know a good deal about it. I think, you know, the book that it was inspired from the role, role doll, or however you say his name, but you know, the original book that it was based on, I think it does a good job of capturing that and, capturing the essence of the story, even if it doesn't do word for word every single thing in the book, but it does a really good job of adapting it and, you know, bringing it to life in, in beautiful color and, and scenery. Yeah, dude, that movie is a classic. And uh, I was I was about five seconds away from making that my pick this week. But when we get to my pick, you'll, you'll see which way I went. Um, but uh yeah, that's one of those movies that I think every single person in the world watched when they were a kid, unless they were, you know, too old to be a kid when it came out. But yeah, dude, Gene Wilder, one of the greatest actors ever. And that movie's just, it's a kid's movie, but it's a weird movie, man. I mean, the Oompa Loompas, the, the acid trip tunnel that they go through where, you know, you remember that part? Well, I was going to say it's, it's nothing compared to the, <laughs> excuse me, the 2000s version with Johnny Depp directed by Tim Burton. That one to me, I didn't hate it. I just didn't really like it that much. I felt like that one was pretty bizarre and out there and weird and didn't really capture the same kind of feelings or uh, splendor or wonder as the original. You know, Johnny Depp, good performance in that. It's just, and I'm not a huge Tim Burton fan. And to be fair, this was less Tim Burton y than some of his other stuff. It was a little more colorful and bright and not as gothic and um you know not depressing but you know what i mean his kind of style that he has so this was a little less of that the charlie and the chocolate factory but i still don't think it it comes nearly as close to the original as they would have hoped yeah i agree i think they said that was i think it hues closely closer to the book 
his version than the original than Willy Wonka, but I, I never read the book, so I can't attest to that. But uh, I do want to glom on to, you're not a big Burton fan, like Beetlejuice or, or Edward Scissorhands? You don't like those or no? Really? So, oh, okay. Some of his stuff, and I've talked about, you know, obviously the 1989 Batman and what a, a game changer that was on a previous episode, but, you know, a lot of his stuff I'm just not really a big fan of. You know, you can see his style and you know looking at a movie that it's pretty much a tim burton movie so for me that's a, a little bit of a turnoff that you know i know directors have their style but you don't want to necessarily make basically the same movie over and over again it seems like a lot of his you know are just about the same material or have the same kind of character personalities and it's just you know it's a really gothic and dark and kind of depressing vibe that he brings to a lot of his movies and you know, a visual style that I don't really kind of get behind. That's not to say I don't like any of his stuff. I'm just not a huge Tim Burton fan at heart. Right on. That's one of those that just is where it's just we'll agree to disagree on that one. I love Tim Burton. I love, Be I mean, Beetlejuice, one of the greatest things ever. Uh, Edward Scissorhands, one of the greatest things ever. So great. But uh, let's keep this moving because I want to get to my movie because I – I did, this is a true ABC, all right? So the movie is, the story was about Kit Kats. Kit Kats are what? They're candy? What's a fra- what, What's another word for, for candy or what's a, something people always talk about when they say, they say candy is dandy? Talking about the coquina, cocaine. So I went with Scarface because that's my ABC, candy, cocaine, Scarface. A, a far and, uh, cry from the article, but okay. Well, I just like that when you started this, you were like, we're going to keep this all light and happy and everything. And in my head, I was like, oh, yeah, my pick is Scarface. <laughs> but I mean, yeah, it was just ABC. I don't know. Yeah, I, was, I almost went with half baked too, because he says that famous line in there candy makes you dandy. But uh, uh, I, I did. I was so close to picking Willy Wonka, but I was like, I don't want to go. I didn't. I didn't want to go too. I figured that would be a, a movie like an obvious pick, as you say sometimes. But for one, have you ever seen that Scarface? I've seen bits and pieces, but I haven't seen the whole thing all the way through. It's a great movie, man. It's a remake. I saw the original, the original from like 1930 or something. And I don't think a lot of people realize it's a remake. And then I think they're even making another, like a new remake coming out you know soon but it's such a good it's it's one of those you know everybody talks about godfather being uh, al pacino's big movie man but scarface is that he owns that movie man that is all pacino and you got michelle pfeiffer in it being like just awesome robert lugia is in it so awesome and i mean the final scene of that movie is like the big you know say hello to my little friend scene it's just a violent it was, their screenplay was written by Oliver Stone, you know, directed by Brian De Palma. It's just, it's a movie you got to have time for. I think it's a close to three hour movie or something like that. But man, it is a, it's a, it's a great movie. And it's, I think it has the, I might be making this up, but I think it does have the record for F words or something. But you can get the time, man. Check it out. Would you put this up there with The Godfather in terms of like making a list of essential movies that people have to watch? Would you put this up there with a similar movie like The Godfather? Would you put Scarface on that list? Absolutely. I'd put it above. I've seen Scarface more than I've seen Godfather. I think I've seen Godfather once. I've seen Godfather 2 once. I've never seen Godfather Part 3. I've seen Scarface probably 10 times. So... It is an essential movie, and it's a good cultural movie too, because the whole point is about the Cuban, Cuban uh, uh, people coming from from Cuba, obviously, to Miami, and then to the influx of, of Cuban America and Cuban culture in Miami. And it's 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 yeah, I, I'd probably put it above Godfather on that list. Yeah, I, th- I think you're right. I think this could be like an essential movie list item for a lot of people. You know, if you're making a list of movies that everybody just has to see in their lifetime, you know, ones like Jaws or The Godfather or Star Wars, you know, and I think I think Scarface could have a, a spot on that list for sure. 
All right, so my last story this week is this week we uh, the uh, there was an implosion of Trump Trump Tower, Trump Casino in Atlantic City, and uh, yes, I picked this story not for political reasons. I don't care about all that. I picked it simply because I like watching implosion videos, man. I don't know how many of those you've seen, but they're just cool to watch. They're just awesome, and it's just enjoyable regardless of what the building is if you watch a, a planned implosion you know you don't want to watch the terrorist implosions but a planned implosion and how they do it and how they set the charges and all that stuff to make it kind of go inward on itself and stuff it's cool stuff and 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 it's just a cool 30 second video that you can watch that just shows gnarly destruction yeah if i'm with you on that where you know it's always cool to see these types of things. And it's, to me, it's a little bit fascinating too, how they do that, how they are able to plant charges or make this, you know, building kind of implode in a strategic way where obviously damage is minimalized and it doesn't, you know, it's not a building just randomly coming down. It's, it's everything is pre-planned and it, it falls down a certain way. And it's just, you know, it's, it's a, it's a understated feat of engineering, I think. And you're right. The videos are always fun to watch, you know, these videos when they're posted online of a building being, you know, kind of blown up or torn down like this, you know, they always get tons of views and people just like just watching. It's like an oddly satisfying thing to watch something like this. It is. It, it's just, it's just, it's just cool. And I mean, I think so, you know, to hop right into it, I think, you know, I went with this for the implosion, but you know, it's a casino in Atlantic city, me and my buddies, when we were, you know, not long ago before everybody got married, we would take our once a year trip to Atlantic City, just, you know, guys weekend. And uh, we, we stayed at the Trump Taj Mahal. I don't think we ever stayed at this place, but we, we did stay at the Taj Mahal once or twice. And, you know, Atlantic City, it has an odor. I don't know if you've ever been. There is an odor to Atlantic City. It's not a pleasant one. But so I just went with the casino theme. And the pick I had was Ocean's Eleven that one that's Did it we, we that's, matched? that's that's the very first time we picked the same movie for a story i picked oceans 11 as well because and i'm sure you're gonna say the same thing of the the scene where one of the buildings is the same thing like you know torn down imploded blown up whatever yeah man yeah and it's, it has the implosion thing and it has and it's just uh and uh yeah just the the the, the casino aspect of it because you know that's what atlantic city is they called it the uh the las vegas of the east or whatever and i don't know if you ever watched boardwalk empire i watched the first season but it's all about the formation of atlantic city uh, first season was great i just for whatever reason didn't, didn't finish the series out yet and uh yeah uh, oceans 11 man it's another one the music in that movie i think you'll notice a theme man movies that are really good have great music that's that's kind of where where it is and that has like you know soderbergh esque you know he always has like that funky jazz music in it or whatever it's a great it's another one with just a huge cast so i guess to draw back to an earlier thing would you say that this movie with its large cast suffered the same fate as like the martian where each character didn't get enough or um I wouldn't really say so in this one. I think it's the same thing where every kind of actor and actress in the movie has their part to play and they do a good job of it. But I think this one kind of balances a little bit better. Um, obviously, the leads in this movie and in the franchise are, you know, uh, George Clooney and Brad Pitt's characters, and they get the most screen time, which makes sense because they're kind of the leaders of the pack. But I think these movies, uh, you know, Ocean Eleven, Ocean's 12, 13 they do a really good job of kind of balancing screen time for everybody and the effect that everybody kind of has on the story. It makes you feel like everybody is even, you know, on their crew and everybody is essential. Like, you know, the jobs that they pull would fall apart without one of them. You know, it's like, it's like a domino effect where you feel like everybody is kind of equally weighted and has their part to play in these, these jobs and these uh, schemes that they pull off. And without one, the rest would fall apart. Yeah, I agree with that. I, yeah, I think they are great. They have their – and a little tidbit, I only know this because I, I did for the Joe Blow thing I do. Uh, Owen Wilson, 
the Joe Blow and Wilson I did was uh, originally the brothers played by Casey Affleck and Scott Pond were going to be Owen Wilson and Mook Wilson, but they turned that down to do uh, Royal Tenenbaums. So, but I love Casey Affleck. I love I love Scott Pond. I thought they did a great job in that movie. And uh, I mean, that's another one where kind of like the Pirates again, where you know Ocean's Eleven is great. Ocean's Twelve a little bit worse. Ocean's Thirteen. A little bit worse. I still love all three, but it was the first one for me is, is the best one, which is also it's a remake of, you know, Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, uh, uh, Sammy Davis Jr., uh, the, 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 the Dean, I said Dean Martin, but Ocean's Eleven back in the 60s. Yeah, a lot of people might not know that it's actually a remake of that older kind of movie. And, you know, I'm with you where the quality kind of varies in th these original three and Ocean's 8, you know, that's kind of its own separate thing. So it's not kind of mentioned in the same thing as these three because different cast, different setup, all that kind of stuff. But um, I will say I differ a little bit where I agree with you that Ocean's 11 is the best of the three, but I'm going to say that 13 is the second best and then 12 is the third best. Because yeah, I, agree. I watched 12 for the first time uh, actually a few months back. And I waited till then to see 12 because I had seen 11 and 13 long before, but I waited till then to see 12 because I had heard that it just, it's not as good. And, and I believed it after I saw it, it just, it goes a little bit off the rails. It's very Soderbergh-esque, even more so than the other ones, you know, his style and his sense of directing. But, you know, the story it just takes like a couple turns too many and it just, you know, kind of goes a little bit wackier than some of the kind of grounded real world heists that the other one have. And it just, you know, there are good parts of 12 and I really like Catherine Zeta Jones, her role in 12 as well. It's a shame her and Julia Roberts didn't really come back for 13 oceans, 13, but there are good parts of 12. It's just, it's a little too kind of off the rails for me, especially when you watch all three in a row and it makes 12 feel even more kind of disjointed from the other two. Yeah. That's the word I had in my head too. Disjointed. That's a good word. Yeah. I think I would agree that 13 is the better because 13, I think at least did a little bit different. I think the problem I had with 12 was it just felt like it was the same movie as the first one, almost pretty much, you know, slightly changed. Um, but 13, you know, you bring in Al Pacino, you bring in Ellen Barkin, you know, you're bringing in great, great talent to kind of close out the trilogy. And yeah, I agree with you on that, but, but I'm happy we picked the same movie could have went any way. That is the first and, you know, might be the last one, depending on how we're going. But, you Could know, I, I, I would almost recommend that somebody, if they were to watch some of these, I would almost say just watch 11, then 13, because, 13 could just, it just feels like a direct sequel to 11 in some ways. And there's only one or two characters that kind of pop up in 13 that were in 12 that you don't really need to know what happens. You just need to know that they exist. So someone looking to check these out, I would almost say just go Ocean's 11 and then Ocean's 13. So another thing that kind of happened this week, it's almost kind of like a, a cultural milestone, you know, something that's just there year after year. And it's the start of the newest season of American Idol. And I remember this show has been around since I've been like a little kid. And, you know, people that have been on it or have won it have had varying degrees of success. But it just it just seems like a cultural mainstay where it's just it's always on. It's a consistent show that's, you know, feels like it's been around the same kind of time frame as The Simpsons or something where it's just been around forever. And, you know, music competition shows really aren't my thing, but I can't help but appreciate, you know, how long it's been able to stick around and, you know, what it's trying to do for people who are trying to uh, start their career in music or are trying to make something of themselves and the stories that they they tell about these people that come on the show. So you know, it's not really up my alley. It's not really my thing, but I still appreciate it for what it is and how long it's been around. Yeah. Uh, my sentiments. Exactly. It's not up my alley. <laughs> I don't, I, uh, I, when American Idol first came on, I watched it, you know, I watched the first few seasons. Uh, and then I, I basically just enjoyed the first two weeks 
of those seasons where they would do the auditions because the auditions back when the show started, you had Simon Cowell, Randy Jackson, Paul Abdul. But you would also, they would show crappy singers and Simon Cowell would make fun of them and they would all make fun of them and it was hilarious. And they don't do that anymore because uh, they don't want to hurt people's feelings or some garbage like that. I don't know. But like those first two weeks of those first few seasons were amazing. They were hilarious. And I... I don't think I've watched the show since maybe season four or five. And, you know, I was doing a little bit of research on this. I was trying to think just off the top of my brain, you know, the show has been on for so long. There's been so many seasons, so many winners, but how many of these winners have actually, have you heard of or actually done anything? And the only, from the top of my head, I could only think of Kelly Clarkson, Carrie Underwood. Um, those are the only two winners I could think of. Okay. Then you have, people who went on to success who weren't winners, people like Jennifer Hudson, Oscar winner. She finished seventh on the show. Uh, Daughtry, who is a pretty big recording artist now, he finished fourth. And Adam Lambert, who uh, I didn't look up to see what place he finished, but Adam Lambert now, you know, he tours with Queen. So those are really the only success stories I I could think of or I could look up. So this show that's been on forever, most of these winners, they're, they're, they're nothing. Right. And that's, but that's you and me. Like, you know, we're maybe not in some of the circles that people who listen to music from some of these people that have been on the show and maybe we're not attuned to like how popular some other contestants have become and the, the scenes that they're in, like, you know, these other circles that maybe aren't mainstream, but they're still having success in some way musically with a different community or something. So You know, I would say maybe outside of our bubble, some of them have been pretty successful, too. But, yeah, it's it's a little bit of a mixed bag with how successful the winners are versus how successful the just, you know, runners up turn out to be. So it's just, you know, it's interesting to see kind of where some of these people go after the show. Yeah, 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 it is. I mean, like I said, those are the only ones I can name off the top of my head. Haven't watched the show since. Hey, you know, Jennifer Hudson. Uh, I'd say she was probably primed to be nominated for an Oscar this year, but I'd say since they pushed back the movie, definitely next year. I think Jennifer Hudson could potentially be a two-time Oscar winner when she plays uh, Aretha Franklin in uh, Respect. Yeah, so, you know, getting into the the movie picks here related to this, um, I feel like, again, this was maybe kind of a a clear-cut, easy choice. Uh, My movie, it's the same vein as American Idol where somebody is picked from obscurity and is, you know, becomes an overnight music star and it's a star is born. The newest iteration of these movies, like, you know, that have been adaptations directed by Bradley Cooper, because we've gotten, I think this is either the fourth or the fifth adaptation of this story. A star is born. There have been ones over the decades, but um, I picked the newest one to talk about because I think it's, first of all, I think it's a very good directional debut for Bradley Cooper. I think him as a director for this movie, he came out swinging and it's a good entertaining watch and a well-directed story. And, you know, obviously the, the soundtrack, you have to nail it on a movie like this that's about music. And they certainly do that. I don't think anyone's even right now has gotten shallow out of their heads yet. But, um, and then Lady Gaga, you know, kind of going full actress because she's been on some other things where she's had some acting experience like American Horror Story is kind of a a big profile project that she's done that she's acted in but you know as far as I can remember this is kind of her first big movie mainstream movie that she was given an opportunity to flex her acting chops and she does really well and obviously she has an amazing voice and really kind of lends it to her character in the movie who, you know, again, goes from overnight, you know, star and country and then in pop and, you know, and it's just a really kind of entertaining story that's told from start to finish about the trajectory of her character and Bradley Cooper's. And it's just, you know, a really entertaining movie. Yeah, dude, I love the star is born. I mean, the ending of that movie, I won't get into it, but it sticks with you. It's one of those endings that sticks with you. Um, and Lady Gaga, I am a, I am a Lady Gaga fan, I, and I, I own her CDs and stuff. Uh, she has a phenomenal voice, without a shadow of a doubt. Um, 
And rightfully so, she won the Oscar for Shallow, which was such a good song. I mean, I bought, I saw that movie in theaters and I came home and immediately bought the soundtrack um, off of Amazon. So, yeah, it's a good movie. It's a good retelling. I never saw the Barbara Streisand, Chris Christopherson one. I never saw that one or the, I think the, the 1930s original story. I never, that, this, the Bradley Cooper Lady Gaga one is my only entrance into that world and it's a great entrance man it's a phenomenal movie nominated for a ton of oscars i think you know i think it only won the one um the the shallow uh, song one but it was nominated i think for best picture best actress lady gaga got a best actress and a lot of people thought she was gonna win and uh it was i think a lot of people thought it was going to be between her and that was your glenn close was nominated for the wife and then uh, Olivia Williams, Olivia, I, we can forget that, but um, from the favorite, she came and, and kind of surprised everybody and won. But uh, yeah, good movie. I said, yeah, yeah, you're probably right that that was an obvious choice because, you know, a movie about somebody who gets plucked from obscurity and becomes a star. That one didn't run through my head. The only thing that ran through my head was this is I just, it's a music story, so I just went with my all time favorite musical which is number three on my all-time favorite movies list, which is La La Land. Sweet steelbook packaging. But uh, yeah, La La Land for me is, it is the single greatest musical ever made. It is a movie I saw, immediately fell in love with it. The music is, I, I listen to the soundtrack still, I'm not even exaggerating, once a week. I still listen to it. It is, the music is, is phenomenal. It's, uh, you know, performances by, you know, uh, Emma Stone, Ryan Gosling, Damien Chazelle, who we talked about, I think last week with Whiplash. Um, and it's just, it's just, I don't even know how to say it without saying it. It's just a magical movie. Yeah. I think, um, you know, will you make a, a bold prediction and say that Damien Chazelle kind of, reached his peak with this movie because whatever he does kind of after this, will you maybe like it as much as La La Land? I don't know. I probably won't like anything as much as La La Land because, but he did do first man after it. And I love first man, even though it didn't light up the box office, just, you know, you take Damien Chazelle, who one of my favorite directors since La La Land and, and whiplash and, you put him in with space, you know, the true story of, of Neil Armstrong and it's a movie I'm bound to love. And so I, I, I think the guy, I, I, I'll be hard pressed. To, I'll be surprised if the guy makes a movie I don't like, because I think he's just, he's that talented of a filmmaker and he's you know younger than me. He's the youngest person to ever win best director. And he won it, I think 32. <laughs> so it's like, ah, yeah. part of me has a little bit of schadenfreude where I'm just like, Ugh. Come on, man! But I, I can't deny how much I, I I think that guy is talented, and and I, I I look forward to any movie. He's he's somebody he he can make he can make a movie that I think sounds like the worst movie ever, and I'll watch it because I think he's that talented. Yeah, and it's it's going to be exciting to see what he does next because, like you said, he's he's relatively young, and I think you know he's got still such a long career ahead of him. So hopefully, he can still make some some great stuff, you know, yet to see here. But um, going back to what you were saying at the beginning of this, you know, I think some other movies, musicals out there over the years might disagree with you about calling it the best one ever. Things like West Side Story and Sound of Music, but you know, to each their own. Like you know, if you like it that much, then power to you i just think like if people are kind of ranking them that those might eclipse la la land but you know um i mean the soundtrack to this one like it's phenomenal you know both the original music and the score and it's just full of jazz and it's very artfully shot and it's super bright and colorful and really feels like an old hollywood movie if that makes sense you know it just kind of has that that look and feel to it and that and the feelings that it kind of evokes in you. And it just, it's a very cinematic movie. And I think maybe it got a little over nominated when it came time to the Oscars, because it was a movie about the movies and about LA. And that just always seems to kind of curry favor of the Oscars. And it gets nominated for a lot of stuff like 
you know, it maybe got a couple other ones kind of handed to it. I, I can't remember quite how many Oscars it was nominated for, but some of them were a little head scratching. But, you know, I think it's still a really phenomenal movie overall. I believe it was 14 and I believe it is tied with Titanic and uh, chariots of fire. It might, it might not be chariots of fire, but it's tied with Titanic and something from a long time ago for the most nominations ever. That's why I remember, I remember when the nominations came out, I was like, Oh, couldn't it have just gotten that one more to be the most nominated movie ever. I mean, obviously I love the movie and I will say, I, I have no issue saying it got screwed out of Best Picture. You know, it was Best Picture for two minutes. And then it came out that Moonlight actually won. Moonlight, phenomenal movie. Great movie. Great romance movie. Uh, not better than La La Land in my book. La La Land will go down in history. Look, that's that's great. You know, I'm again, I'm on the other side of the, the spectrum here. Where I think Moonlight absolutely deserved winning over La La Land. But, you know, uh, I think it's still at the end of the day, no one can take away that La La Land is still a very good movie for sure. So for the past uh, five or so episodes that we've done, we've done it where we've done a new release movie of the week in parentheses or quotes, whatever you want to call it. But um, you know, it's going to be a little bit of a burnout kind of watching new movies every single week to have one to talk about since there aren't really going to be that many big new release movies such as Godzilla vs. Kong or ones like that to talk about. So instead, what we decided to do is kind of mix it up a little bit where we'll keep those options on the table. When a big new release movie comes out, we'll certainly watch it and discuss it like everybody else at the time. And you know, we'll still talk about new movies that we watch during the week if we really like them, such as, you know, Whiplash as an example from last week. But, you know, we're going to have weeks like this where we might go with a third option where we just kind of pick a movie that we haven't discussed yet on the show, on the podcast, and just talk about that at length and just, you know, kind of discuss it like that just to give ourselves a little bit of a break and to kind of mix things up a little bit. So, you know, with that in mind, do you want to intro this week's kind of we're just going to call it movie of the week, you know, that we've decided to talk about. Yeah. Movie of the week. Yeah. I mean, basically just, this is our, this is our wrap up of the show. So it's, you know, it's a quick little thing where we can just kind of sit back and pick a movie. We both see, have seen and kind of give it a, give it a, uh, give it a little wrap up. So for this week, I happened to watch uh, Deadpool during the week. I hadn't seen it in a while. And, uh, you know, it's one of those I just wanted to go back and watch because I hadn't seen it. And it's just it's a funny movie. It's a it's it's a it's a superhero movie, but not cut from the same superhero mold as anything. And, you know, and, you know, Deadpool is kind of in the news right now where they just announced that Disney's going to keep it R rated and um, uh, it's you know going to be in the MCU and stuff. And so, you know, just, uh, you know, when you watch it there are certain movies that you watch where you kind of remember the first time you saw it, you get that feeling, you know, if you haven't seen something in a while, you go back and watch it. You remember that feeling of seeing it for the first time. And this, that's kind of where I, why I picked this movie because I had that feeling watching it, which was the seeing it in theaters, big crowd of people, which boy, do I miss those times, man. Even though I can't stand people who talk and text during movies, I love going to the movies. And, you know, I just remember you were glued to the screen, man. It was, it, Deadpool was unlike anything you had seen before. Big superhero, R-rated comic movie. And, you know, Ryan Reynolds at that point, he, you knew Ryan Reynolds, but Ryan Reynolds, this movie took Ryan Reynolds from, like, star that everybody knew to, like, He'll never not be an A-list star. I think that this movie elevated Ryan Reynolds to like legendary status. Yeah, I, um, I'm with you where this really kind of shook things up and it was different than a lot of movies that had come before it. And we, we promise next week, you know, we'll pick a different kind of movie, a non-superhero movie to talk about because we have been talking about those a lot recently. But that's because they're so prevalent these days. But still. Um, you know, with Deadpool, it's just, you're right. It was, it was just an entertaining watch from, from start to finish. And, you know, I do miss experiences like that where, you know, I miss the experience of going to the theater as well. And, you know, this was a movie where it, 
wasn't necessarily it couldn't necessarily be ruined by the people who were the usual like talkers and textures because this was the kind of movie that you wanted to see with the crowd because you know it would get laughs and it would get you know kind of people being entertained from start to finish and it wasn't like a movie where um it was quiet a lot of the time and you had to like listen to the dialogue and really pay attention to the story and those are the types of movies that i think people ruin a lot more when they do some of those things but I think this was a movie where if you saw it in theaters, those kind of people wouldn't have necessarily ruined it for you. But this was a movie that I think would have been more enjoyable seeing it with the crowd. And and I did. I did see it in theaters. But, you know, it's just it's entertaining from start to finish. It's funny. And, um, you know, I'm glad that they're moving forward, keeping it as is for the new iterations that they might make. And who's, who's to say they stop at three? They might do more. They might do uh him popping up in other kind of marvel movies i mean who knows but um just him getting to interact with these other new mcu characters for the first time is going to be uh comedic in in and of itself and going to lend itself to some great jokes so i'm excited to see where they they go forward with this yeah man and i think as good as deadpool was i watched deadpool one and two you know did the double feature and i actually like deadpool two better than Deadpool 1. I think as a movie, it, it, it is a more full-fledged movie. I, I like the story. It, it, it took away the, the uh, what's it called? origin. You know, a lot of these first movies need the origin story, which Deadpool was an A-plus movie for me. I think Deadpool 2, for me at least, was A-plus+. Plus. Fair so enough. I tell from your face. You... I think it's been a theme where we've taken opposite sides of a debate this whole episode because I'm going to say that I like the first one better than the second one because I think a lot of the humor in the second one has already been set up by the first. So, for instance, jokes that we had for the first time in the first movie in the first Deadpool that, you know, people weren't really expecting them and the, the themes and the fourth wall breaking, you know, that was kind of groundbreaking in the first one. And then in the second one, we're kind of used to some of that humor. And I think some of the humor maybe had less punch because of that And when you're watching the second one. So look, I still like the second one too. I think it's a good movie as well. It's entertaining in, in different ways than the first one. And it kind of builds on the original as well, which is what a sequel should do in my opinion. But, you know, I just think it doesn't have as quite of a fresh new impact as the first one did when it came out. But it's still, I still like Deadpool too. It's still very enjoyable and i think they'll do a good job at the third one despite some of the same writers not coming back which kind of worries me a little bit but you know i think they will definitely handle it carefully and do a good job in deadpool 3 when it comes out see the the writing thing did worry me when i first read the headline that they had hired a new writer until i looked up who they hired and she was a writer from one of my personal all-time favorite shows brooklyn 99 that right there was just like, okay, you wrote for Brooklyn Nine-Nine, you're probably going to write a good movie. Yeah, so. I think um, that almost kind of seems like a show that the the same style of humor translates well to Deadpool. You know, I just think of the style of humor in Brooklyn Nine-Nine. I think of the style of humor in Deadpool. And to me, I, I, I think, okay, that, that seems like a pretty smooth transition. You know, I can't really put it into words other than that, but it just seems like the writers would kind of fit right in writing a movie for Deadpool using some of the same approaches that they took to writing humor for Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Yeah, man. Well, time will tell, but I'm looking forward to Deadpool 3. All right. So I think that's going to do it for this week's episode. Uh, As always, we hope that we pick some movies that maybe you hadn't seen or heard. I mean, one for you, Mitch, you had never heard of The Burb, so... Hopefully, maybe that's something that you throw on your stack to watch at some point because it's a phenomenal movie. And, uh, you know, we will be back next week with a new episode. Don't forget to, if you listen on iTunes or Spotify or any of that good stuff, check us out there. Like the page and all that good stuff, you know, spread the word, I guess. Uh, any, any final wrap-ups you got there, Mitch? No, just wanted to thank everybody for tuning in to another episode here of Life Imitating Movies. And, you know, we'll be back at the same time at 10 a.m. on Monday. So, you know, I just wanted to say thank you again for tuning in. Yep, yep. Thank you, everybody. Take it easy.